And the same thing I say on the air. If you take the tapes, there's someone in Oregon and someone in Jacksonville, Florida, they get the tapes. And they each, the maximum is 20 to get out, so they handle it. And they have to have the sheet, the bibliography with the, the tape. And I say, if you want to do it, sell them no more than $5, best quality tape you can get, make a profit, get 20 out there, get 20 out here, no copyright. The broadcasts aren't copyrighted. The tapes aren't punched. And you can send them anywhere you want. You can make as many copies as you want. I'm not in the business of making money. I'm here to get information out. And that's what I do on the radio. I don't take any money. I, if I write articles, I get money. But otherwise, I want to disseminate information. And if I keep it all for myself, that's silly. And the best way to get information out is let people spread it around and talk about it. So everything can be taped. And uh, I, as I say, if people call me or send me stuff and don't want it disseminated, um, I throw it away. One woman sent me a lot of valuable stuff on the Vatican last week, and she said, don't tell anybody. But, <laughs> but she lives in Minneapolis, no, she lives in Michigan. But I'm going to put on the air because she didn't ask me first if I keep secret information. She mailed it to me. So it's going to be part of a radio program because <laughs> uh, if she wanted me to know, then she wanted everyone to know. I don't have any relationship with that woman one-to-one -one, or with anybody else. Now, I'm glad to see there's so many men here for Women's Week, because I love men. <laughs> I love men. And I'm so glad to see men, because the world is made up of two kinds, men and women, with gradations either way. And I like, I, I don't object to those things that way, but we are basically two kinds. And as I say, the gradations and the playing around and all the other things, you can be anything you want to be, but there are men and there are women. And I, the reason I handed out this little sheet with you is that before we get into politics or questions, the minute we're born, we're political. And the quality of our life is important. The fact, say, that I write or that I'm on the radio or that I do research or that I know who killed John Kennedy isn't important unless I myself am a decent person. If I don't get along with my parents, if I don't love my children, if I fight with my neighbors, if I don't get along with those people, I'm not going to make the world any better. And the only reason I'm doing this work is to make the world better. And the only way to make it better is to change the quality of our lives. And it isn't just job money for women. It isn't equal pay is important. Status is important. I would get much further with the radio if I were a man. I've been on the air 13 years. It's because I'm a woman that the information doesn't disseminate faster because men have an authoritarian voice and women sound like your mother. So you don't want your mother telling you what happened. And that maybe set me back, say, 20 years in being accepted as a political researcher. But I didn't do it for that purpose. I started for my own interests, my own selfish interest to find out who runs the world or who killed Kennedy. I didn't do it for any of you. I did it for me because I wanted to know I'm on the planet Earth and I want to know who's here and who they're killing. And we talk about elections. They're talking about it's March. They're talking about November. And if the, if the wrong guy gets it to some people, he'll be dead in a thousand days. You have to listen to two years of campaigning to see him gunned down with his head blown off. So it isn't who gets nominated. It isn't who gets elected. If he gets elected, can he live? If a man wants to take black people out of slavery, if he gets off the drug habit, if he gets out of the crime syndicate, and he talks at Harvard, and he's educated, and his name is Malcolm X, he says, you know what they call me? If I get a doctor's degree here, they call me a nigger. He knows the chances of survival are small. He works his way up. He made a mark. Martin Luther King made a mark trying to get people's wages higher, raise their standard of living. But when he was gunned down, two black people on the balcony didn't even say a word about it up to this day, Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson. They used it. They played with it. And they were silent. There are men that are silent, there are women that are silent, and this is Women's Week, so we're going to talk about women's conditions, of particularly women, but in a world also with men. And women start 
and men start with things made in their lives. Uh, I have a circle I gave you. The family you're born into is determined for you. The economic status is determined for you. It's very hard to leave it. I live in Carmel and there isn't a little child in Pebble Beach that doesn't have a computer. And a Mickey Mouse telephone in their rooms, I've seen it. <laughs> And they're enrolled at Santa Catalina School, and they'll go to Robert Louis Stevenson or back to Groton. It's all set. They're two years old and three years old. It's set. And that is one problem. Your genes is another thing. I think whether you're going to live or die young or be bald or fat or a lot of things you can change, a lot of things you can't change, your genes are very important, and you've got to work within those. The color or your race is important. American Indian as against a white Swedish person arriving in Hollywood. Who's going to get into Dynasty? Who's going to be cast into the big time movies, right? Sex is important. Your male or female is determined for you at birth. How you accept it, what you do with it. Your religion, it's hard to break. Not all religions are determined, but if you're in a Catholic home or a Mormon home or a Jewish home, Going back 200 years, you're already in a data bank in Interpol. It doesn't matter who you think you are, and in the Mormon data banks, you're already in there back to the year 600, every Chinaman. That reel goes around every single day while we're talking. They're taking the birth reports of every newspaper, of every family, of every newborn every week. Who marries who, who the families are, and you know, just like I study the obituaries, because when somebody dies, we learn all their interconnections to various corporations and boards and things they've done that we didn't know when they were living. Well, they take the birth thing, the death thing, the family members, the survivors. If Mr. Joseph Goldstein dies, he's buried at B'nai B'rith Ma Mausoleum, and his son is Tim Harden, and the grandchild's name is Ellen Irish, they go down as Jewish in the computer. Religion is determined. Those fools have changed their names. Maybe, it, maybe it's right. If you need a job, you change your face, you change your nose, you change your sex. Like, yeah, you, you know, a lot of people doing that. It, it's a symbol. But you do what you have to do. But you, in order to be in this world, you have to accept certain things. Then your country, where you were born. If you were born in El Salvador, and Ronald Reagan today is slipping through $90 million on a little labor bill, just to kill, just to kill. What chance did you ever have, Catholic or Protestant in El Salvador? Those things, unless we make efforts to take these boundaries and understand the boundaries, we can't say, oh, I prefer Hart. No, I like Mondale. It isn't that simple. We have to pin them down to what are their boundaries and where are they going to put us into what classifications and what boxes. The parent education is important. And I have over here on the left, education, the family that you have. Are they literate, illiterate? Who are your teachers? My father told me when I was young that if I went to college and found one professor I liked, it would make a difference. And I was at Stanford. I don't remember the one. <laughs> Maybe it was Dr. Bookstaper. I was a philosophy of the religion major, believe it or not. Yeah, I guess you could. <laughs> I wrote to Bookstaper a few years ago. He lives in the Midwest. And I wrote to him, he writes a lot of books. The books you read or don't read matter. The TV you watch or you don't watch matters. If you take the line of least resistance and flick on some dumb flick because you say, I just had a hard day, instead of taking something very controversial that you may learn something about that makes your day less hard, everyone opts you know, for the can of beer and the dumb TV, not you people, but the majority want a relaxing day and then they wake up and find the cover of Newsweek that all of the United States money is out in other countries and there's none in our banks. They opt for the easy out. They want the dumb, the cheap, the vulgar. They fill their lives with trivia. And that's important because they say, oh, that's too frightening. They say to me, aren't you scared to be doing all that work? You know, isn't it frightening? And I went for my not annual checkup every five years. My blood pressure is like 100 over 80. The doctor told me the same when I was 16 years old. And I just finished my income tax this week. Uh, all the money went to books, copying paper. I didn't have one prescription. 
I'd had three visits to the doctor and two were for poison oak. <laughs> okay, and one was a finger infection. And, and there was no medicine and there were three dentist trips, two to clean the teeth and one because a filling came out and I was eating taffy that I shouldn't have had. Okay. Now that for doing, you know, 10 or 12 hours a day, most of the days of something I really like. And the answer is that I really like it. Otherwise, I'd be a basket case. You know, if this, and that's the trick. But down to education, magazines, what do you read? How many newspapers do you read? I know a lot of people in town say, I don't read any paper. It's too upsetting. They're so dumb. I mean, what if there's some good movie? What if there's a parade you want to go to? You know, the Butterfly Festival, you know, in PG or one of the Lantern thing, you want to see the princess float out on the water. I mean, that's fun. You know, and what groups do you go to? What kind of conversations do you have? These are very important for your input because the family is important and then you have to spend, you get 20 years from them and the teachers, then you have to spend the rest of your life unlearning what the first two taught you. So the ratio is just unlearn through other means. Figure it out for yourself. The answer to everything is out there. Every single question you want to know is out there. And the only thing stopping you from finding out is the company you keep. You change your relatives. You don't have to see them except your parents or your brother or sister and your children. The aunts and uncles and cousins, if, the, if you are not inclined to be a fascist, and they are, there's no reason to be insulted in their company. You just don't have to. I no longer and haven't for 15 years defended myself at any social party. I'm only with the people who do what they like to do. People call me and they say it's so lonesome. They're closet researchers. I don't have anyone at work. I don't have any family. They think I'm crazy if I listen to you. I go, well, you're with the wrong people. I had to go through that. I had to change people. I was living in Los Angeles. We went through the Democratic Convention when Kennedy had the acceptance speech. And uh, there, and uh, I was with Democrats. We worked hard to get him elected. And then as soon as he was shot, these people weren't interested at all. LBJ was good enough for him. That old crook that was put on, you know, he wanted to be president. The best way to do it is to off your buddy. And, you know, that was good enough for them. And I began, I ordered the Warren Commission hearings. And by September 64, I was reading. I got to volume one, page four. And I knew the people I was around with were really screwed. I mean, they were just crazy. And I kept reading, I said, let's have discussion groups. Let You take one volume, you take another. Let's get together once a month and talk about this. They didn't want to. So I just stopped seeing them. And then eventually I realized that I was in a sort of a cesspool where I was of circumstances of people that were not going anywhere or thinking about anything. So I just, we came up to Asilomar for a conference. We'd been up before for a five-day conference and, and uh, uh, the one we went to was on existentialism and Zen, and I am an existentialist. And I said uh, to my husband, I'm going to sell the house, we're going to move up here. And he had three stores down there, and that sounded horrendous. And I called the real estate lady and just had to put a sign on the house, and that really threw my chili. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, it, it took a couple of years to sell the big house. I began, I had a dining room table, and I began to turn in everything I had and getting books. I mean, anyone who came in that day could have the silver, the china, the linen, Mar Gablin. Believe it or not, if you saw I live now, I had enough sit down for 150 people for dinner. Silver and china and all the, the crap that goes with it. And I began to trade it in and trade it in. Then we moved to Carmel, and the closet was still about that big with dresses, and I turned them all in, you know, goodwill, and got into the making things out of patchwork stuff during the late 60s and 70s and making our own stuff and and turning in all the shoes that had to match the purses and all the garter belts and all the traps of society. Just began, yeah, got a giant grater, like a moolie grater, just got rid of it all. And the more I got rid of, the richer I was, the better I was, the happier I was. I was on the right track. If I wasn't on the right track, I could stop. But I was on the right track. And I tried to figure out, you know, what this world was about. I'm on it. I'm on it, so I may as well know about it. And then there's other factors besides education that affect you. There's drugs. Drugs in your food that you can't see. There's cigarettes. Three of my best friends this last year, two of them just died and one is dying. 
she doesn't think she's dying of cancer and she's still holding a cigarette. She burnt the floor of the hospital yesterday. She doesn't know the cigarette had anything to do with the cancer. She's only 56. Medicines you take. As I say, I don't, no prescriptions, nothing. I don't like them. I don't trust the doctors. I happen to be a vegetarian. <laughs> I happen to be a vegetarian. I, I don't get fat and white sugar. I get carbonzo beans and pasta. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and rice. But, and cheese, you know, you don't lose weight on it. But I don't get a chicken that has dye in it, you know, meat with false fat. And if you cut out as many papers as I do, and you see all the crap that they put in those beasts. I stopped eating meat when I read about dioxin in the chickens for the school lunch program from Mississippi that went to Chicago and Illinois, to Michigan. And it was sent to the, specifically to the school lunch program. And so I knew, well, this is racism in getting the poor people. They'll die young, and the medical business will be a big, growing business. As the Howard Hughes organization said, I have a memo that was, that was dated in 1976. It said, keep the Hughes Medical Institute going. It's the fourth largest industry in the United States. There's oil. There's narcotics. There's what? Weapons and, and munitions and drugs. Now that's your world. Obviously you don't like it, that's why you're here. A lot of people out there still like it. So I don't have to scold you. You wouldn't be here if you liked that world. But that's the way the world is. And so your dental care, you take care of your teeth you, so that you don't have toothaches, so that you're not complaining, you stay healthy. My parents are 93 and 90, they have their own teeth. They go up and down the steps two or three times a day. Uh, that's why I say genes are important. My dad says genes are important. <laughs> I believe him. <laughs> but there's invisible, invisible stimulants in food. In the cola wars, read about Coca-Cola and Pepsi, you know, the, the stimulants that were put in there, cocaine, to make the people work faster in the factories. That's why they put those machines in the factories to get more out of you in a work day. It didn't matter when you dropped dead, and I do drink Diet Cola once in a while. I, I do sit on some of these. Uh-huh. I do. Fresca and that stuff, I'm hooked on it. But I'm trying to change, but I do like it. Uh, another thing, I, I just made a few notes here, and then I'm mostly going to take questions from you, because I usually talk on the radio, and you have things you want to ask me, so I'm going to take your questions. A lot of this doesn't seem political to you, but it is. You can't do political work or change society if you don't have a good mind and a good body. You limp around, you say, I wish I could, but I can't. I got arthritis, I got sciatica. I got psoriasis. I would do something, but I'm sick. Well, you don't have to be sick. I had two people working for me this winter, and each of them, my friend Terry and another girl, Deanna, and they got these terrible head colds that were going around. And they were at the house, and, and they said, should we come to work? Terry, you know, and Deanna's terrible. And I said, well, they thought they'd give it to me. And I said, well, don't worry about me. So they came the next day, and then the next day, one was too sick to work till Friday, and the other one was home two weeks, and she's only 20 years old. And I started to get the sniffles, and I called them, and I said, okay, you gave it to me. And I said, I'll give it 24 hours. That's all I give, anything I get. I sit and talk to it. I explain that I'm busy, and I don't have time for it. And I understand it's there, but it's got to go. I did that once with a back thing. I can tell you a lot of things I've done, and they work. They work if you want them to work. They don't work if you don't want them to work. That's like Women's Week. We'll talk about women for one second. When they have their periods, oh my God, it's a crisis for everyone around them. If they want it to be a crisis, men, women, family, husbands, children, everyone they know, it's a crisis. They got that period. Or they had that child, it's a crisis. I got this and that and pain and can't walk and blah, blah, blah. It's nothing. It's nothing. I read Pearl Buck when I was at Stanford. She, kids, women had children out in the field. I figured that out and got up and took care of them. It's nothing. They have personalities from the day they're born, and, and your period is nothing. You don't have to take it out on men. I'm telling the women, you don't have to abuse the men by this thing. It worked with my daughters. You know, when they started, they said, hey, it started. I said, fine. They never had a cramp. You know, they're women now. They never had a cramp. Why should I put that trip on them? Why should they be laid up some days or call I can't work or have this heavy flow or this light flow? It's natural. It's nothing. 
And women take advantage of men, and I'm going to scold them because they shouldn't. Now, if you could be one person, I'm going to ask some of you later, maybe help me. If you could be one person or several people, who would they be? If you want to change the world, and you're here because I'm political and I'd like to change the world, if I could, or in some way affect people that will change the world, who would you be? You've got to have heroes of some kind, dead or alive. It doesn't matter. Somebody you like. And then what traits do they have that you would like? And you write down who your heroes are. You can change them next week. I've met people I really liked, and then two weeks later I thought they were terrible. I liked them for 10 years and found out they were phony, and other people I've liked steadily through. Who are your heroes? And what do they like? And then you be like them. So that when you're listening to the radio, when you're reading your magazines, if you're writing to congressmen, if they don't answer you, you won't be frustrated because if you yourself are a whole person, you don't have to worry what they are. If they reject what you say, if they send a form letter and you say, I'm never going to do it again, if you send a letter to the editor and they don't print it, there's so much frustration in research that researchers fade off. They get discouraged. They go into little holes. They can't continue. And that's because they're not whole people. If you're a whole person, you can carry that through. There are a lot of people, these long-lived people like uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Winston Churchill and uh, Bertrand Russell. There was a whole series of 80 and 90-year-olds. Carl Sandburg, you know, the octogenarians that, that went on. They had, But the thing about their lifestyles, or Henry Miller, who I adored, it, their lifestyle was consistent with what they were saying. So if you want to change the world, you can't go out and tell somebody what to do, and then they look at you and they say, well, look at you, you know, look at well, you, you know, nobody talks to you, where's your family, you know. If they say, well, why can you tell us what to do? I mean, the only way you can make changes is to live right all along. And then those rejections, and sure, I've had plenty of rejections as a researcher, but I throw it back as their problem. The people that have done it, I wouldn't trade lives with them. I've looked at them some almost for 20 years, and I wouldn't trade one minute with them. So in keeping, who are your heroes, and are there any limits? And I have this circle of limits. What are your limits? Now, I left blank spaces there because each person, after he has his choices in life, has to fill in what he or she does to make life worthwhile. And I put in my own circle. My concern was my husband's, too, <laughs> and family. My husband didn't want to live in Carmel. He had the stores there, and he was commuting back and forth. And then he decided that it was too hard to commute, and I would never go back to L.A. And that we would, you know, stay friends. In fact, he's having a dinner party for me and the children next week in L.A. <laughs> My ex-husband, we are always close. But I wouldn't live in L.A. As long as he doesn't want to be away from L.A., I'm not going to kill myself. I know my limits. See, I would die in a city like L.A. There's so much floating sleaze and ambition and money and dirt. And he's not going to kill me. No man is going to kill me. And that's where women's history comes in. You have to make decisions. If he's going to put you where you can't survive, it's by dropping you in an oil pit. He can go himself, but I'm not going in it. No way. I know my limits. Home is first, but a home is two people. And if one of them wants to live in that environment and literally die in it, that's his choice. That's not mine. I'm not going to, nobody could push me around that much. So 20 years ago, I moved up to Carmel and I wanted my children out of the shopping centers in Century City. And I want them out under the oak trees and in a quiet place with sky and no industrialization and pure air. I learned to pick my environment from Henry Miller. He said, you can be anywhere you want. You can go out on a limb. Nothing is really going to happen to you. Take your chances. And a lot of things that women are put down about is that we think we need men. We think we need somebody, daddy or boyfriend, or somebody next to us. Coming down here, I was playing a tape deck of Stephen Sondheim, my favorite composer. And he has a song he wrote early on that he wouldn't write now in his first days called Saturday Night, that to be alone on Saturday night is dead. Well, Sondheim wouldn't say that now, but that was this mindset in the early 70s or before that, in the 60s or before that, to be alone. You're never alone. You can be home alone 
one night and get 17 calls from friends all over the country. Really good friends when you travel, you stay at their homes, you see them, they come out here and stay at your homes. You're never alone. If you're a decent person, there's no such thing as being alone. And if you're alone, you stand a chance of meeting another decent person. And women are put down. You know, they're put down uh, if they want to be alone. And being alone, you can be with the best minds of the world instead of with some slob in a smoked out restaurant. <laughs> you don't have to do that. I found that most people want your company because they're lonely. And I found that I had so much to do, I didn't need their loneliness so that I was doing my work. But are there limits placed on us at birth? Yes, I think there are those limits, I said. But then you can change those boundaries if you understand the limits. It's like you can, I think you could change the government if you understand the government. If you don't believe you understand it, you can't change it. Just before the lady that was speaking here, they asked her about Ronald Reagan breaking unions. And she said, oh, no, he wouldn't do that. Unions are all right. She just sort of passed that off. She doesn't know Ronald Reagan. That's your changing those women because Ronald Reagan is breaking unions. He does. When you, did Adolf Hitler have unions? Why do you think all Central America is being gunned down or, or Grenada taken? Because Maurice Bishop had unions. That's what it's about. And after they take everywhere else and they're starting here in the United States, they're declaring bankruptcy of all the major corporations so they wanted to pay the wages and bring in the Japanese corporations and then, then you're really locked in. If you don't understand your government, you can't change some of these things. So some of these things can be changed or I wouldn't be here. If we're locked in, totally it'd be silly to be here. And then what constitutes happiness or what is success? Uh, a lot of people say, you know, there's a lot of frustration about the work or sharing with people. As I say, they're lonely. They don't know what, what to do to get information out to their friends. Find everything that makes you happy first. Then go out and change the other. I did. Otherwise, I couldn't change anything. I couldn't do anything if I'm not a happy person. And there are people here who I know very well that know my family and know me. <laughs> How about it, Glenn? We're pretty happy, aren't we? Sure. He knows the home. Pretty good place, huh? It's all right. It's all right? <laughs> Would you trade it with someone you know? <laughs> huh? <laughs> okay. Now, once you set up your boundaries of how people can poison you or how they can entrap you, then you can change. Because I really believe, see, I've met doors. Not every door is open. And I put here, life is a maze to go through. You have to find the right doors. It is a maze. It's a maze every day. But we put up walls for ourselves, too. If they don't put them up, there's a lot that aren't there that we put up. People, I remember when KFAT was going in and, uh, uh, what's his name, called me and said, well, how can you live up at, at, down in Carmel. It's so white, it's racist, it's, you know, it's not a homogeneous community. And uh, it was Travis T. Hip. He called me. He was up uh, Watsonville. He says, how do you live down there? I said, where else in the United States would I get 13 hours a week, 13 years, one hour a week on the radio to say anything I want? There are no such things as stereotypes. We have the Navy Postgraduate School, Ford Ord. The Presidio Language School, Keshawa Satellite, Hunter Liggett with the, the radar uh, laser weapons, the Monterey Institute of Foreign Studies. John McCone is the president, head of the Monterey Institute of Foreign Studies. He was the CIA director when John Kennedy was president. He was the ITT director when Allende was killed. I can be four miles away on the air every week, and he has never bothered a station. Now, it takes guts to say it, and he could call up and stop it, but look how much mileage I've had. If somebody stopped it tomorrow, they could take the old tapes all over and just keep playing them. It would be new to people, and it would be very important. People play the old tapes over and over. It's new, and it's pertinent. It's pertinent to what I said was going to happen and how it happened and hearing it happen now. People in New York came me at the Elgin Theater in 1976, 75, and Huge crowd, and they were all worried about Nelson Rockefeller being president. That was the shtick. I said, no, Ronald Reagan. You know, forget it. And, oh, they, that actor from California, they looked down at him. New York, it's Rockefeller. It's Rockefeller money here. It's the Chase Manhattan there. It's the trilateral. It's a, there was no trilateral then. It came in 79. It was a council of foreign relations. 
blah, 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 David and Nelson. Well, just before the election, Nelson is deep sixth in the arms of Megan Marshak and Poinchetta Pierce. He was supposed to be wearing a diaper sucking their breasts. That's what Nelson Rockefeller was doing when he dropped dead. But he, they trapped him. The Secret Service was outside. They got him. Nelson never made it. Reagan made it. So if I never did one more broadcast, you could listen to the old tapes if you have them. And people, you know, in New York, they play those over and over and say, oh my gosh, you know, why would we miss the boat on that one? They should have been, just like I say now, you should start doing research on Evil Younger. Because Evil Younger will either be the head of the FBI or on the Supreme Court. And Evil Younger is the evil man. He was our attorney general in California. He was a district attorney in L.A. He's trying to change the California laws, the California Constitution. Now, he's one of the most evil men in the world. But everyone will sit back, like me, so the hearings now. They sit back. Oh, I, pulled, I shouldn't say this. Okay, I'll say it on the tape. No, I better not. <laughs> well, I have one story to tell you. I won't put it on the tape <laughs> about the Mies hearings, because that goes on the radio. We do have secrets, see? <laughs> Remind me later, and I'll tell you the secret about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in my own life, you know, people think, oh, my gosh, you know, it, this must really be a drudgery. You know, and this is another thing. You can all be political. There's no such thing as turning your whole life over to any single cause, except Joan of Arc. You don't have to. So in the blank spaces, you fill in what you want. As I say, I start with the family. One of my hobbies is photography. I took photography classes when I was pregnant because I figured I'll be the best one to take the kids' pictures, and I don't want someone to come in every year and get this big, gross thing made. So. I took a course in San Francisco, and then we moved to New York, and I took a, a color photography class with Eisenstadt from Life Magazine. He was on TV just last week. We were talking about Eisenstadt's work. I took one class in color photography. We went from Kew Gardens into New York City, the new school, once a week, and just to take that, because I had two little boys, and a husband I wanted to know how to take their pictures. So from the time they were born, I shot a roll a week for 34 years. Have any of you done that? A roll a week for every Hanukkah, Christmas, Easter, Halloween, the costumes, the Thanksgivings. And you know what they do? The kids come home, and the first thing they do, they're color-coded. Each one of the kids has their own color album, and some are duplicated, but some aren't, so it's more interesting. They come in the house, and the first thing they do is sit on the couch and get the pictures. They love it. I have a daughter at NYU, and she's coming in tomorrow. She won't be in that house 15 minutes, and she'll be on the sofa with Jeanette, and they grab the albums. It's the most meaningful thing, because while I'm doing my work, they have their egos. They are people. And everything they do, I mean, there's no radio program. Well, I was on the air. They were pretty well grown by 71 when I started. But as they were growing, there wasn't one costume they wanted that wasn't made. David wanted, <laughs> he wanted to be something like a spaceman once. And then at midnight or uh, around midnight, he said, no, on Halloween, it was one day later, he wanted to be Zorro. So I had to go out and get black fabric and make the Zorro for 3 o'clock afternoon parade at the school, you know. But I did it. I took sewing courses, hobbies, photography, sewing, needlework. They all have their samplers, birth dates, gifts, their houses and apartments. I make cross-stitching for them. I'm making, I make quilts for each when they're born. I make quilts. You don't have to just be political. The only reason I'm telling you this is that you can do a lot of other things and be political. So that sewing, you can fill in the blanks for you, the needlework, the cross-stitching, uh, quilts, everything. When they have children, they can put the quilts on that they had when they were little, each one of them. And it carries that continuity. Life, in order to fight for a society that's better, you have to make it better. And when you walk in your door, you better be sure it's better, you know? And music is one of the things we did, music and theater. And music is marvelous. There's politics and music. Coming up along the same date, tape deck, there is this two-cassette album of Sondheim's music that they just put together, a new one, some old songs and some new. And on the sheet, it mentions Pacific Overture, his favorite song of all he's written. He's probably America's greatest songwriter of this field. And his favorite is that Pacific Overture the, in the treehouse and the signing of Japan to America. <clears throat> now Japan is moving in to California to the factories and bailing out the Vatican banks. It, I listen to that music, and there's a song I hear on there that I don't remember where I was when I saw that play with my family. We started taking when they were four years old. 
And there was a little boy, and there were two little boys, and a little girl, another little girl, and another. They used to, people loved to see them come in, and they saw every musical comedy, got every record, and they're all into music and art and theater, and we have a really good bond. They're out of the world, and they're doing their thing, but it's so precious. And you, there are wonderful things to do. We went through the rock music and the Monterey Pomp and Dylan and the Beatles up at Candlestick Park. I mentioned on the air. I didn't know when I took them to see the very last Beatle concert that a few years later, Yoko Ono and John Lennon would pay Paul Krasner the money to publish my first article. Everything, it makes a circle and a cycle. Life, life is so interesting if you let yourself be open and to flow to things. When I was in New York, my uh, programs on KLRB were played on WBAI, and I was on one night, and the daughter of my best friend heard me on BAI and called me, and Kathy was so glad to see me. Her mother and father had passed away a short time within each other, and they had died, and Kathy was very depressed, and she went away. She was studying acting. She went to New York, and she didn't want to see the old friends or family, and she heard me on BAI, and she called me, and she was so excited. So we went together. We had lunch. went to the theater and could talk about the family now because she was really upset. In fact, every time I see her, I start to cry because her folks are very close. And when she got married, I, I wanted to come back east. I couldn't go there. I said, I'll babysit for the first baby. And the baby's born in London. I couldn't afford that. They were in London. They were going to Prague. I said, as soon as you have the baby, I'll come two weeks to New York and I'll babysit. So I went there. It was last January. Two, that's two weeks of January. Or one of February and one January. And I, in the part with Mandy and Kathy, he's an actor. I knew he acted. He got the Tony for Che Guevara and Evita. But I didn't know what they were doing in London. My relationship was with the kids. And I said, what movie? What did you do in London? He said, I just finished Gentle. And now he's Mandy Patinkin, who made Gentle. And I'm there doing their dishes and making the bed and cooking for the house. And she was got a part in Top Girls with a nervous wreck and never left the baby. I, the time was perfect. So I was a surrogate grandmother for two weeks. And I just, it's not because of what they are, but then now he's opening up next week in Stephen Sondheim's Sunday in the Park with George, who's my most favorite composer. And here are these two kids, you know, that I went back to be with. So I love Sondheim. And here's a full cycle of people that, if it weren't for my radio program and WBAI contacting Kathy and then her being able to be with people and her parents, and then taking it another step and, you know, keeping up with the wedding and offering up with the baby, and then your world, you know, just opened so big. She, the woman who wrote Top Girls was in New York, and she wanted me to go to uh, see her. There was a party. She's a very successful playwright who wrote Cloud Nine. And I said, no, I'm not here to meet people. I'm not, maybe you know that, I'm not a people people. I don't go out to meet people. And I said, I came here to sit with your baby. So you go to the party, and I sat there until 2 or 3 in the morning and took the cab back to my son's house. But the research, those are just a couple examples. It makes a full circle. It makes your life so rich. Because here you're writing a thing for Krasner for the realist. He has no money to get it out. It's just the time of the Republican conventions. It's about Watergate. And it makes a full circle. And life is very rich. I don't feel deprived with all the things I do. And one other thing, I'm going to take questions from you. Uh, uh, a lot of the personal things I don't put on the air, so that's why I'm to share them here. Um, then we'll get into politics. Women's <coughs> Week is very important. Um, it's, it's important to bring yourself up to everything you want to be. And don't let anybody, any woman or man, be in your way. There are women that are the enemy of women as well as men. Eva Braun was a woman. Evita Perone was a woman. Martha Mitchell was a woman. Martha Mitchell was a bitch. And when she got injected by this Steve King, I went to Flo Kennedy, who's so active in the women's movement, and said, let's have a demonstration in front of the Sloan Kettering Hospital. She was injected with cancer. She doesn't deserve to die just because she spoke up. She said, the mafia's in the White House, and I saw dirty tricks. She doesn't deserve to die, even as a fascist. Women, some way, should say, you can't stick a needle in that woman. You can't keep her from her child till she's dead. You can't isolate her in a place where nobody can see her. That's when women should really have come behind women. Because it's your, gonna, it's your ass next time. It's your ass. If the attorney general can do that to his wife, he can do it to me. He can do it in Jonestown, cyanide men and women. 
if he can shoot his wife in the ass and take a lawyer to a hospital, Kalbach, who is the attorney for uh, United Airlines for the Republican Party, if Kalbach can take her and use a phony name and take her to a hospital for injections and she begins to fall apart and her bones are all crushed and there's no hearing in all the Watergate books about that, that was the title of my first published article, Why Was Martha Mitchell Kidnapped? Because, see, if she's a fascist or if Patty Hearst is a fascist, the point is they're practicing on them for us. But the women, there are women in history that we depended upon. There's women in elections. I think of Bella Abzug, who phased that. What does she say about fascism? Murders, assassinations, Reagan. She flops around from lunch to lunch, and you write to her. She turns off. She doesn't answer it. Coretta King out there endorsing Mondale with a trilateral and Brzezinski and all the fascism of Jonestown last night, Shirley Chisholm, just limp people who were pushed out of the system at the time of Watergate who didn't assist a single researcher. Barbara Jordan, who's down there teaching in Texas, who gives a big speech for Carter, so we think all the blacks and the women, we've got a coalition here, and then everybody got screwed. Fades out. Women, that's why I go so much into personalities. These women lack something on that wheel. So they let you down. They have stayed within their boundaries or tried to get out of them by placating other people. So that women, per se, are just as dangerous as men and they are just as nice as men. And women are put down by men and they're put down by themselves and they're put down by other women. So when you have, same as black history, or the Jewish uh, celebration, or the, the crying, or the Holocaust. There are Jewish traitors. There are black traitors, like Jackson against Martin Luther King, opening that up. There is no such thing as any single person to depend upon or any organization, but there are people, and they, decent people work together. And what you need in this country, that's why I'm so glad to see Hart get some kind of a, a boost up north. It was a coalition of decent people who came out of the woodwork. They just came out of the closet. They weren't on any poll. Nobody counted them. Nobody thought they were anything, and they came out of the closet. So we're going to have to come out of the closet as decent people and look at what the candidates are doing and look what our life is doing. Look at the air that's polluted, the water that's spilled. You have pollution up here in this area. We have right in Salinas, Firestone plant. That's Leonard Firestone is Ronald Reagan's kitchen cabinet. He's been pouring deadly chemicals into the Salinas water since before, for 20 years. And they discovered in 1981 and didn't say anything until 1984. It would cost $20 million. Why did Firestone close the factory? So they wouldn't get cancer. They let everyone else find out what was under the ground. They leave. Why, why pay health insurance like the asbestos companies? They don't want to pay your life insurance or your health insurance. So they close the factory. And then you find out all these pollutants. That's the kitchen cabinet. Edwin Meese, the one reason I called Washington, Edwin Meese is on that Stringfellow Dam, the Roar Industries, vice president, dumping all chemical poisons down there. These are deadly people. But when you go out, the main thing I do want to emphasize with you is when you go out in the world as women, be a whole woman, whatever you are. Be happy where you are. And if you're not happy with that, change that while you change society. <coughs> Don't go out and think that a person is going to change it for you. If you've got the best president in the world, you'd still have to live with your parents. You know, if you've got the, the best senator in the world voting the right things, you still have to come home and get a letter from your kids. Whether it says, I hate you or I love you, makes all the difference. And it gives you more energy to do what you want to do. Now, one quick remark. It was in the paper. Maybe some of you saw it. Uh, Isaac Singer was putting down Barbara Streisand gentle, and he said that uh, she didn't have to go to America. He said, weren't there enough yeshivas in P Poland or Lithuania? And he said all she would be doing was coming to America and working in sweatshops, to paraphrase it. That's what he gave her the choice. You'd, be a, you'd marry a salesman in New York, you'd move to the Bronx or the Brooklyn, you'd rent an apartment with an icebox and a dumb waiter. Why didn't you stay in Poland? And her answer to Singer was, I noticed you came to America. You, made, you came here. And it's still that Mr. Isaac Singer putting women down. Oh, these are your choices, lady. Walk up three flights and watch the ice melt. 
Even in those days, those weren't your choices. But this generation has a, is really going strong with the women's movement because they know now those aren't your choices. Singer knows that those weren't the choices then. There were some women breaking out and on their own, and they're part of women's history. But the important thing is that men still think that way. And you have to change. I think you change their thinking in what you do, not in verbally arguing with them. See, if you do things well and you're happy, you can prove you don't need them. It's nice if you have them, but you can prove you don't need them. If you're unhappy, then they say, see, you don't have a guy taking into the restaurant. But if you find ways to do things you like, I just listed my hobbies. You can do all kinds of things, weaving, pottery, you know, anything, go out, deep sea diving, anything you want. But do it and like it and be with people who like it and do it well. philosophy of life that about the research being a part of it. Now if you want to get into the political questions, you tell me, you ask me the questions and I'll answer them and see what it is you want to know about. First me, I'd like to make a couple plugs if I can since I wasn't able to introduce you. Oh, well, you can. <laughs> well, this is Mae Russell as we all know now. Um, I'm from Women's History Week here at De Anza and we still have events going, events going on today and tomorrow. Um, Sandra Kurtzing from Ask Computers is at noon, but we'll probably still be in here. She's upstairs. The Dinner Party, Judy Chicago's uh, film from The Dinner Party. Tomorrow is um, Self-Help and Abuse Day. The Older Women's League will be here at 9.30. 10.30 we'll be showing Killing Us Softly, which is advertising images of women and how they are used in the commercial industry. 11.30, Men Against Rape will have a speaker here, and at 12.30, um, images of violence against women um, and in pornography and the media. And um, today for coming out here, we'd like to present you with this button. It says, you. Ronald Reagan, fascist gun in the West. <laughs> <laughs> we have all kinds of buttons and some bumper stickers upstairs that we're selling. Um, we have programs that you can take home with you. I'd like to plug some of the people who have sponsored this, the student body of De Anza, the program board, the re-entry program here at De Anza, Renew. Um, Students for Economic Democracy put in a lot of work and time, and the gender equity group, and all of this was able to get, uh, if you happen to pick up a program, you'll see we had a very progressive week, very, very happy week, we're, we're real glad with. Um, later, uh, probably around quarter to 12, you might notice this little orange can coming by and on the side of it, it says donations. We will take anything from a quarter to $10. Um, we're very poor, we're running on a very sly budget. We just made it and uh, we hope you can come back for tomorrow's events as well. Thank you. Okay. The camera here reminds me of the 70s. You're not from the 70s, are you? <laughs> Too young? What, was it a student paper? No, just a person. Oh, do you listen to the station every week? That's good. Okay. No, I'll let you take it. Uh, okay, there. Question. Can you speak on your uh, use of intuition in going to what it is you think is important? I heard you probably several months ago you spoke on that. Intuition? Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, I'm very open to um, intuitive ideas. A lot of people get freaked out when they hear it. I don't do research on that basis. I collect articles and books because I have references every week to where the sources of information from. But I do, in many cases, get a clue of where to go. I don't want to scare you. <laughs> I, don't want to scare you but I see things. I, I see things intuitively um, that can happen, that do happen, or the way they happen. And then I scrounge around and get the sources of information and pursue it, sometimes 5, 10, 15 years. And then the answer comes. And But I do, I think... Uh, I don't know when my first awareness came about. Um, I think when I was in India, I was 15 years old. Something happened to me there. A lot of things happen to people in India. And 
it was crazy. We took a year and went around the world, my family, and they took me out of high school. And uh, Japan was sending all the arms to Manchuria. We were in the hotel day that was being bombed by the Jewish underground, the Aragon, and Mussolini had just taken Ethiopia. My parents wouldn't let me go. Somebody who was traveling with us had a son who was with Down syndrome. And in those days, it was like the Middle Ages. My folks wouldn't let me go. Mr. Hood was taking Johnny, and they were going to this boat off the shore to see Haile Selassie. And my mother wouldn't let me go because Johnny was there. She thought somebody, a mongoloid, might rape her daughter. You know, I was 15, just 15. She was, I mean, there, there was so much ignorance. Today is nothing like that. But I, listen, this was the Middle Ages. I'm 62, so you have to understand that. This is 1936. So, uh, uh, we went to India, we went to China, and the boat, present line hit a boat, and all these little sandbams come out and take the clothing off the dead because there's layers of ships. This is during the days of Chiang Kai-shek and Jin Rickshaws, and, and layers of ships that never touch the shore. They born and die and never get to the shore, and the clothing they take from ships that crash, and they're tearing it off the bodies. And I was brought up in Beverly Hills. I mean, I was, a lot of people brought up in Beverly Hills get worse. But I don't know what happened <laughs> to me. <laughs> I mean, it does, that's just because you're there. People there travel, then they want more money. They go over there to take it back out of the country. But uh, something happened to me, and then in Calcutta and Bombay, you know, when the days are hot and people just lie down the streets and sleep, and that's all they have in leprosy. And something, something came to me about wanting to change the world. I didn't know what. I was just a kid. And very spoiled. I spent my summers in Michigan and on a lake with speedboats and my grandfather in New York and shows then and clothes. You know, I didn't think you could buy anything on the West Coast. My parents spoiled us. And I was really affected by that trip. We went to Alexander and the kids, you know, they had snotty nose, the flies stuck to it. And then we went to Nice and then we were the last American family in Spain when the revolution started. This was in June of 36, and we couldn't go to Paris because there were riots. But something intuitive happened to me in, thir in that year in India. I just, something said to me, you know, in some way you're going to make some change in the world. And I didn't, I didn't know how or when because all I ever wanted to do was to get married and have a family. And it wasn't until John Kennedy was killed, and, and the day because we had seen him at the Coliseum and had the straw hats and the, remembered the convention and everything. I was, and, and my God, eight years of Eisenhower and Nixon and all the Cold War and the Whitaker Chambers and the Rosenberg, we were ready for a change. And there was so much hope. Like people have hope now, but if you don't solve who does the murders, the one you want the most will surely be gunned down. And there was so much hope. And so he was killed on Friday and on Sunday, Jack Ruby, uh, walks in the jail and kills Oswald. And there was something that I heard that day. I've had it on my programs. How many of you have heard that broadcast where I talked about it? Do you remember that one? I did it a couple of years ago, that broadcast. And I heard somebody say that Jack Ruby was at the home of H.L. Hunt on Saturday afternoon, from like 2 to 3 in that afternoon. But in the history of the assassination research, it was with every broadcast of ABC, CBS, all... Uh, radio broadcast, and I've collected everything there is, and every tape and every print out of a broadcast, it was never heard on the air. You couldn't delete it from everybody. You know, it was never heard. And they said he was at the home of H.L. Hunt. Well, this was a man ahead of the Birch Society and worked with people that wanted John Kennedy dead. So I then started to save newspapers, and I, uh, when they had the Warren Commission assigned at the end of September, or no, it's December of 63, I put in an application for it and sent $76, and now we're thousands of dollars, but the, they only printed like 1,000 volumes, or maybe 7,000. And I ordered the Warren Commission hearings. And then I went through every word of everybody. And Jack Ruby, uh, there's a brilliant, in fact, I wrote a play called Tiger by the Tail. And the first act is Gerald Ford, Leon Jaworski, and Earl Warren in the cell of Jack Ruby. This is true. And I really should work on it, get this out someday. The second act is the lie detector test he takes. And um, verbatim with a juggler, in a man in front, sort of like the Che part in Evita, up in front talking, and then a screen in back, flashing things that were happening. But I went through every single word of those 26 volumes for nine years. And when they got to Jack Ruby, they kept grilling and grilling him. And he could account for every hour that everything he did the week of the assassination, and from Friday morning up through Friday night around the clock till four in the morning, he got to see a poster 
about uh, from Wanted for Treason, you want to know who wrote that, to Saturday till 2 o'clock, and there was no record of him that afternoon, any time of him. And in the Warren Commission hearings, they had him at the office of H.L. Hunt the Wednesday before the assassination. And from reading the testimony and the interrogations, I gathered that he agreed to do something. He owed the government $40,000 taxes, and they were on, he went to see Hunt on Wednesday, and his taxes were paid off the day of the assassination. And he wanted a new Playboy Club, and so the old place down there on Commerce Street, and he was seeing a decorator and a real estate person. So he's coming into money. But those two hours have never, ever, and that's what really what started the research was that somebody in Los Angeles, a very prominent man, who was a member of the Birch Society, and there's a friend here who is a member of the Birch Society, uh, and that's okay, you know, because not everyone in the Catholic Church is part of the Vatican Mafia, you know, <laughs> or every Jew isn't part of the Zionist assassination teams. But uh, there's organizations and there's people in them that really mean well. But this man had told me when Stanley Mosk, the uh, attorney in San, he was now in the California Supreme Court. He made the remark years ago that the Birch Society was little old women in tennis shoes. And and this man told me uh, once we were in the I'm very impressionable. I was in the elevator of a building going to a hearing somewhere and doing something. He said, "May don't ever believe that remark." He says that's not true. He says, "You keep doing your work and check it out because it's not true that it's just a hobby thing of little old ladies in Pasadena." And as of this last year, you see the computers from the Los Angeles Police Department set up through the Birch Society, through Larry McDonald, with Mr. Steinholtz from the Luftwaffe and Mr. Johnson Laub, who's head of the World Anti-Communist League with the Nazis from World War II. Um, tapes of everything that happens in California, every meeting we have goes down the LAPD, including this one. And it goes into a recorder, then it goes to the PD, and then goes to the computers, and then it goes to Washington, then it goes to Germany and Vienna. So uh, it was a threat, and he was right, so I did my work. But though it started me with the work was something I heard. A lot of people don't understand that. I sometimes, like after Chappaquiddick, I could hear, I could see exactly how it happened. And I got every book on Chappaquiddick. I can't solve every crime that way, but instinctively, it's like when I started working for Larry Flynn, he wanted to get out rebel and. And it was all enthusiasm. Everything was being great. You could make X amount a week. And oh boy, you know, after all these years, you could pay for the books, get out of debt, and pay all your bills. It was a great chance. And after one month, I saw it was crazy there. And I said, I'm not going to send a manuscript, and I'm not going to accept a paycheck. I'm going to sit back. And the whole thing crumbled. He was in debt. The people were all from the government, for intelligence agencies, some I had on the air, some that I couldn't mention on the air that were worse than you can imagine. And the smartest thing I did was just to pull back, not pull the old money tree and take as much as I could till it fell, but just pull back and stay away from it. I could use the money, but I didn't take the money. And but that wasn't just instinct, but I mean, I didn't even know who was there, but I could see an awful lot of danger from who was there, and there was even more. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. I'm well versed in COINTELPRO, the CI's program to just really black people. Do you know of any program, uh, say, or the related organizations used to discredit the women's movement? Something like COINTELPRO? Well, see, the NOW and the women's movement really didn't take hold strongly until after Watergate came in 72, June of 72, when they were arrested and it started to come unglued. But Gloria Steinem's always been with the CIA. Flo Kennedy, I know, is part of that agency. The top leading women uh, take an ego role like Simon Wiesenthal representing the Jews, who's nothing but, I think, a Gestapo chief. I mean, just the lowest scum. So that the top women's people, see, the way uh, you tell, you give them a good idea, you go to me, a good idea, and they say, no, not that. See, they want to direct it. And people that I know that have gone to the groups and organizations, they're directed by it, and they're directed by people because every organization needs money, and the only money tree is Uncle Sam. He has $22 billion a year for that, and more, businesses and franchises. So that, sure, they turn in reports. Sure, they can pull out something. They build up Jenny Foote, build her way up, because she's the woman they have the most on. Like they build up Eagleton to be vice president as soon as McGovern announces it. They say, oh, wait a minute, he, he had shock treatment. See, well, you know, uh, our president needs shock treatment. <laughs> you know, he's insane. 
A guy that wants a cure shouldn't be put down. The, the one that's insane is the one who needs it. You know, but, but the people I know that Gloria Steinem and these people are uh, agents. They've worked with the CIA all their lives. And you can't get through to them on anything. So how many people go to the meetings? They, they take the mailing list. A lot of people get the mailing list. And they volunteer their time. And then they fade away. Of course, oh, getting back to Ginny Foote, they build her up. I read this. What was it? No, I didn't read this one. I heard it on the radio. They said Ronald Reagan isn't going to take issue with which candidate in December. But he's already sent for the papers, the full papers on heart. Well, if your vice president is George Bush, who was directed to the CIA, they'll find that he farted at a PTA meeting. <laughs> you know, they'll do anything. They'll say the woman died of it. You know, they, they'll have everything on heart within one hour of now. They already said it. So if you want to run, here's what we've got. You know, with George Bush sitting there, they have access to every computer. And everybody's in a computer. So the women's movement, of sure, it's good. See, the women's movement uh, will not take on other women who have not made progress for them. It's like everybody has to build his own sand castle at the beach, and the wave takes it all away. You know, nobody tells them, look, if you go across the street and build something on the grass, it'll stay forever. They let you claw in the sun, get your accolades, win your ribbon for the best sand castle, and then it washes away. And they stay on top. That's the way it's done. Like, it's like every time somebody's murdered, they call in Mark Lane. He's still on the grassy knoll. He's still counting bullets behind the bushes. And he can come up with a lost frame of the Zabruderfeld. 20 years later, he come out with a branch of a tree that was removed. Anyone who has a new idea since Dealey Plaza is a researcher. So on the 20th anniversary of Kennedy's death on, on Not Line, they have Dick Gregory, the comedian. He went to the conspiracy conference we had in Boston in 1975 and said Kennedy was alive at Parkland Hospital. But he's on, he's on Nightline with Mark Lane and, and Coppola is saying, now tell me, give me a smoking gun. Tell me where it is. Where would you go after 20 years if we want to open it up? I sent for the transcript. He says, well, there was a puff of smoke over the bridge by the bridge. You know, Mr. Rowland saw, you know, a puff of smoke. He's taking you back 20 years. He stays up on the dry land and builds his castles, publishing economically, you know, eats his own lunch that he took down to Jonestown because he knew they were going to die and he'd want to eat their food because it would sedate him before they died. He tells us on the plane going down, they almost took away his license to practice law, but he's too valuable to the system. So he sits out there, you know, with Charles Gary, and they watch 912 people die or hear it. And then he writes a book, and then he writes another book. He's the only one that can talk on the subject. So in the women's movement, there are certain spokesmen, and anyone else will never aspire to get up to the top. Yeah? Well, I know there's been a lot of researchers that have had strange accidents happen to them and such, but how come is it that, that there's some of the best researchers that are still going? Well, some of the best researchers are still going because, say, if I meet somebody like Larry Flint and I want to write an article on the Korean Airlines, he liked it so well, he says, I'll give you a magazine, right? <laughs> I'll give you a rebel. Okay, he, he hands it to a person who then calls in all the top Defense Department people, and within a month, you have Gordon Novell and G. Gordon Liddy and all the, you know, and the whole gang that I've had on the air. Now, Larry doesn't know that when he's in a federal pen in Springfield, they're screwing his daughter and raping his 14-year-old daughter. He got hurt as much as me. His intent was right, but it can't work that way. If he's going to use Mae Russell to publish and this Nazi stuff has been suppressed 20 years, he should sit down and have a strategy meeting of, like I said, this wheel for your life. You have to have a strategy meeting if you're going to break any new field and decide all your obstacles and choices first. And then he should have kept quiet about Daniel Graham and Vicki Morgan. He shouldn't have told anyone he had the tapes till it was time for the elections and had a surprise. You don't go around, I got pictures of Ed me screwing, you know, Vicki Morgan. I got pictures of poor Larry's in a federal pen in Durham, North Carolina. I mean, and, and again, it goes back to your, the wheel determines your life in a sense. He never got through high school. He was poor. He made $100 million. He thought he had it made. Money will not give you success. His political instincts are right. You may not agree with his sex, and a lot of women don't because it's pretty raunchy. But take his po political side. He's doing more like, than a lot of other people on that sense. But he didn't sit down and talk about 
what are the perimeters that we move with this stuff if I do it? He called me, should I buy these tapes? I said, no, he bought them. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's it. You lose your company. They'll kill you. Um, people, see, the publisher gets hurt before I do, because if you take away my publisher, it doesn't matter what I do. If I know where to publish it, it doesn't, I mean, we can sit and talk 40 or 50 people, and you can tell 40 or 50 people. You know, the thing is that, that people power, and this is why I'm on the air, and I like what I'm doing. I have a tremendous faith in people power. The resistance, say, against the Greek Nazi, the military hunter, the resistance against the Nazis in France. Uh, there was no FM radio to identify them. There was no publisher or playboy in France saying, you know, Mr. Milan didn't write articles. Sure, he got his head crushed, but he's a symbol of decency, and other people emulate him, and they want to remember him, and families want to remember him. And it's better to remember as a victim of somebody trying to change the world for better than being the person who's hurting everybody. And uh, the thing is that there are not many publishers. There are not many people you can get out with, but people can get the word out. That's why I don't copyright what I do. That's why I want tapes made. If you can afford it, you can make a hundred tapes of anything you have and send it to anyone. Because it's all true. I'm not making up stories and I'll stand by what I say. And I'm not doing it to hurt anybody. So I feel very confident. I can feel confident because I feel I've done the work. I've done the homework. And the things I don't know, I can take you to lead you to where the answer is. Some things are locked up 50 years or 75 years. They say, Oswald is alone and you can't see it for 50 years. Not till all of you are dead. Well, that's a contradiction none of you should have put up with. Because then when you get a candidate, if you don't get a candidate you like, you're going to live like Chile and El Salvador. And if you get one you like, he'll be killed. And that is the fruit of that tree that you're going to have to live with, is allowing them to do that in the first place. I always wanted demonstrations around the National Archives. In 1967, up at Kizar Stadium, they were fighting the war movement. And, uh, and I said, let's have a march like this around the National Archives to find out who killed the president. And the consensus of all the little booths there, of all the radicals and things was, oh, Kennedy was nobody. He was just a rich kid. Well, two days later, the war escalates. And he was better than what followed. And he didn't deserve to die if he's in, and he's different than Nixon and Eisenhower. Uh, tell him what you want and give him a chance. He doesn't deserve to have his head blown off so fast. So, you know, it's hard to get stuff out. It's up to people. I never, see, I don't have any false illusions, or nor would I want to stand at a place any bigger than this, or say at Madison Square Garden, because that's where Malcolm X gets it, or, or Martin Luther King. When you see a sea of people, black people in a racist society like that Congress in Washington, then you're going to get a bullet in the head. If you stay home and go every city to every little group, that's how Khomeini got in, through tape cassettes. I don't know if any of you know it, but a friend of mine, he went to Europe all around the world in 1971, came back in 72, and I started on the air in May of 71. And we used to make the big reels and send the various radio stations, and I taped it sometimes like... Marguerite Oswald said, tape every broadcast of yours. I wasn't getting them out there. She says, people will just quote you or try to embarrass you. And if you tape what you said, they can't delete it or change it. So I started uh, taping my own things. And this friend went to China, Russia, Africa, Middle East, and he said, the tape cassette is the revolution. The cassette is the revolution. He said, they're in every mosque. And I have articles to show how the most armed man in the world was the Shah of Iran. The most awful police was the Savak. The most equipped electronic equipment, from Hewlett Packard up here, from Stanford, from all these institutions up here in San Jose, made him the best equipment any human being on earth had. With Richard Helms, our CIA director, who moved over there, he had the best intelligence in the world that money can buy, that American brains could produce, came out of the best colleges of MIT, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, put them in this valley, the best police he thought he had, and the tape cassettes in the mosque caused the revolution. Now, I'm not pro-Khomeini. Somebody said to me, well, do you like him? I said, look, when you get rid of Adolf Hitler, you don't get Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> what, what we put in is what we left them with. They're saying fundamentalism. I'd rather wear the Shador than be a, a girl in, in Hustler. 
you know, they, they have made their choices. <laughs> and and we put we put so many in. But he lived in Paris, but this friend went to Europe. He said, every camel, they translate them. He said, and this friend learned seven languages before he went to Europe. He worked for CBS, and when the students were killed in the South, this was Jackson, Mississippi, before the uh, Kent State, and the major news media told him to bury the story. Don't tell about the black students that were murdered. And a few months later, a month later, it was Kent State, and the whites were killed. So he sold his car and golf sticks. He'd worked for IBM 10 years. And he sold every material thing he had and stayed in his apartment and learned languages, and then took a trip to all these countries to see what was going on. And he came home and said to me, put it on tape and let it flow, let it go anywhere it wants to go. Tape it off the air, any of you want uh, sheets. I get piles of mail with address, self-address stamped envelopes, and I fill them with the bibliography. Tell your relatives, cousins, friends, teachers. Even if they think you're crazy, they may just be saying it on the surface, but inwardly, you'll hit a chord. They're not all stupid. You'll hit a chord. And it, you know, it's, you'll get to them. You don't know. Mendel Rivers was the guy, the most conservative man in the Senate that broke the My Life story. The liberals wouldn't do it. Ted Kennedy and Fulbright, none of the liberals would break the massacre story. It took a conservative Republican. And they do a lot. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that the name of the game actually is education and publicity. And I think Reagan, from his point of view, is doing an excellent job. From where I stand, he's doing a better job than Joe Goebbels did for Hitler. Well, the same people write the speeches. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that the radio is fine as far as it goes. Now, the VAI and KBFA and your program finds the radio, but people today do not listen to the radio very, very much. I'm thinking in terms of reaching the mass of Well, let me tell you one thing. I used to do programs with Bob Trevor a lot on KGO until three years ago when we talked about the Vatican. And they took him off the air because that was a no-no. Three years later, you can talk about the Vatican. He had some kind of a seniority there where you couldn't fire him, so he does commercials and spot news. But I was on KLRB then. Well, this was three years ago, so I was on nine years, ten years. Okay. I <clears throat> did one show with him. I did a lot of shows, but one show, I remember, got 900 letters in one week at my house. 60,000 or more people from Mexico to Alaska, they do listen. You call Ray Talafiero or some of these people at night, and the BAI night shows from 1 in the morning to 5 in the morning, the night people are more alive than the day people. <laughs> they are. Night people are fantastic. I can be on Jim Eason and nobody writes. I'm on a night show, and my mailbox is stuffed. Are you saying that the fact that there's more people listening to radio than they do to television? Well, what I'm saying is... is, is no, what I'm say? saying is that, that to play this game, you don't psych out which is the most. If you hear something that's offensive on a program, call up and tell them. Be heard. How realistic is that? How you can't have people who come home from work, right? And as you said earlier, pick up a can of beer and want to listen to us on dumb show. How many people yeah, but, but, what I'm saying is this? Okay. As long as they listen to TV, no. that is the so-called quote. Okay. Guys. Okay, let me but, say that. Yeah. Okay, go on, go on. As long as they are listening, and it's a proven fact that 80% of the folks do, many more, listen to TV every night, maybe to the tune of three, four hours a night, and the women in the house, or whoever else is in the house, maybe eight hours a day, right? Okay. So it can be a pretty effective weapon, I mean, for our cause, because we, don't, we probably don't agree on everything, but as long as you're against Reagan, you're on my side. Okay? <laughs> now, what I'm saying is... And since you've been, for instance, on the radio for 14 years, and KPFA has been around a long time, and they do reach a certain segment of people, it's mostly people that you're talking to yourselves. That's why, what I'm saying is this, to put it very simply. In the mail, and you do probably too, and so does everybody else, you get every week, you get all <laughs> kinds of uh, uh, letters asking for contributions to all kinds of, uh, of organizations, saying and now and... Washington Watch, and God knows what, there must be a thousand. What I'm mm -hmm. asking you now is, if we could get some of these organizations to contribute some percentage of their uh, publicity budget towards the building of a, of a TV station, which is possible now because that low power stations, which are 
Okay, right? And we can get somebody. Now, I don't know who. I'm not as well versed as you are. But my first thought is tell him to get up there and make the speeches that he has been making and telling it like it is. I think it would be a hundred times better than any radio, any combination of radio stations. And well, the message yeah. is, is something like that viable? And well, how would somebody go about trying to organize something like that? Well, so that's viable. Also, they're talking about satellite TV, which is good, too. A 24-hour news for researchers. I've been talking to people about that kind of thing, because that's very important. A satellite... Yeah, what I'm saying is if we have the same people doing those programs as our reporting news today, which is a prostitute press, I mean, yes. there's no doubt about it. That what I'm thinking of is to have your own private, funded by the people, by like KPF. Oh, I would love it. Okay, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. We have to work for something like that, even though radio, to me, is slightly effective. This would be a hundred times more effective. Whether it's possible or not, I don't know. It is, po it is possible. Um, there is cash out there. As a matter of fact, when... Larry got those tapes. He spent twenty-five million. I said, "Sell them back. Give me one million for a research center. You could get all these newsletters out and things to the major news media, sheets of what's happening, critiques of these appointees and stuff, or do something like that—a radio station, build a research center." But then, of course, they closed in on him. But there is a point where it, I think it can be done if people would work together. There should be a one station, twenty-four hours with news. That is controversial. That isn't this placid. I mean, everyone in the world doesn't eat pablum. So why should they have it for news every night? You know, I mean, we don't take that anymore. We don't take spinach that's boiled for an hour. So why do we take their news? When people get the idea that they don't want that kind of garbage, and maybe a way is to write to people like Brockow and the major news stories, you know, and tell them, I can't stand your stuff. I think 60 Minutes has a fairly interesting format. And it seems concerned about issues that are more personal. But I don't think there's enough pressure on the existing media, and I think they're a bunch of whores. And I don't think you can change them. I think you have to do your own thing. I agree with you. I would like to know where the funds are. Uh, the people who have the money, see, the contradiction is the people who have the money have made it in the system so they think that if they give you a nickel to give some real news, that Russia will swallow us all up and we'll be in Siberia. So they'll take anything less than the Gestapo coming to their door to make waves. And the poor people have the energy and want to do it, but don't have the money. It's hard to get people who have money to realize that you don't want them to lose your money. You want the quality of life to be better. That's the main thing. What they eat. See, a guy can be a millionaire and live. See, he lives in Pebble Beach like Firestone, but he pollutes Salinas, the poor people. And if you go to Firestone and you ask money for an alternative radio station, you ask the big bucks for alternative radio, they think that eventually you'll undermine their profit system, and they're going to make profit wherever they want. Well, I'm thinking about going to people like The Nation, the progressive magazine, people who are fighting for the right things. Of course, when it gets to the very, very... Uh, well, the nation's always been broke themselves. They can't go from month to month. Those those publications are, are borrowing postage stamps to get out. They go month to month. They're not rich. I understand that, but at the same time, they do have money. They have been publishing. The progressive has been publishing for what, for yeah. 40 years? And every year, they, they're in dire straits. Well, the yeah. Guardian, every year they're in dire straits, but they've been publishing. Well, I believe there should be a union of so people. They, they, yeah. That group of people, I don't know how, but if they would spend some of the money that that they do have, they have, and even maybe the fact that they would advertise for the fact that they would like their own independent, yeah. free and independent TV station, maybe more people would contribute. Because even though I agree with them, I get tired of every year having to contribute to the same thing. I know. Same I've thought about the problem plenty of times, believe me. So that's what I think if they could, or they would, uh, use some, uh, some proportion of the money that they have for their own publications, towards a centralized, free, independent TV station of the satellite or local or whatever, yeah. I think oh. it would be much, much better off in the world. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to put you in there. Please have the pictures. Yeah, it's yeah, I just Andrew's wanted to say that, over. you know, if you wanted to start your own radio station, it's going to cost you a million bucks or something like that, which is unrealistic. There's used bookstores out there. You can spend $50 and get a whole shopping bag full of all sorts of books people just throwing out. Um, there's tapes. You can make a copy of your tapes. Give it to Foothill College. They, yeah. The students can go there and get copies, you know. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you know, let's be cost effective. A, radio, a TV station demands all your attention. You can't do anything else. You just sit there and get zombie eyes. Just like uh, stuff in nutrients and candy bars. Yeah. Um, I used to have a always wanted to talk to people, you know, who are clean-minded, open-minded, that talk politics. Um, I see that I watch what Reagan and these people are doing to us, and I think uh, they are building something that I am going to have to handle one day. And uh, now that I can tell them that what you are building, it's not what I want. Me, as your child, do not want to have nuclear weapons and everything here. And I think I'd like to talk to people like you. Yeah. One thing that has been going on recently is that Reagan, you know, <coughs> over November, December, said his budget is balanced. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he's, uh, the guy that handles, handles his finance, you know, says the budget is not balanced. We are in trouble. Um, uh, Mandel, you know, gets up, he wants to be elected, you know, he's talking, he's uh, using his charisma, he's almost gaining everybody's power, and we are in a bind here. The guy we vote for is the person that is going to, you know, handle the ship. If he turns it the wrong way and tells us he's going the right way, you know, he's going to be. Uh, Reagan says he has balanced the budget, he said he will balance, you know, he's going right, vote him a second time, and he will make a paradise of where he is right now. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit well, about these two people? Well, see, I think that um, politics after 1963 is all set. I personally believe that if you don't insist, like, say, the information on Kennedy was locked up for 50 years, and then the House Select Committee had an investigation, in 1976, they locked that up for 75 years. And I think if you don't want to know who killed the president that was elected, then they don't intend for you to elect a president you want. And if you find out who killed the president, you would have found Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. That's why they became president. Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission. That's how they became president, because they have a bag of tricks. They worked with the killers, and they covered it up ever since. And if you don't go back, if you read books of history, of American history, every major crisis that has happened to us began in 1963, after Kennedy was dead. They keep going back 20 years, because that gave the military the right, two days later, to escalate in Vietnam. It made the intelligence community on top. Alan Dulles had been fired by John Kennedy because he didn't trust him. He was put on the Warren Commission to investigate his death. Uh, elections. See, what I would do every candidate that I'm through, I would say, would you open up, there's a lawsuit now, open up the archives so we can see who killed John Kennedy. And if you are covering it, why? Fritz Mondale, if you were elected president, would you release the Jonestown papers that the CIA set that up? You were there. You were vice president. George Bush was vice president when Task Force 157 was killing Salvador Allende in Washington, D.C. Everyone in office and everyone they entertain is an assassin. They had the president of South Korea, who was head of the intelligence military when he shot his friend. Marcos from the Philippines. They'll have Pinochet, who killed Allende. Every dinner guest, except for the Queen of England, has killed somebody. <laughs> You know, as long as they get, you know, they stay in forever so they don't have to. You know, but the thing is that all these blood, people with blood dripping from their hands. They have a massacre in Lebanon and they invite the Israelis in and they invite uh, Jamal in and every, every dinner guest. Look at the list and right after who they die. Last week they, they had Prince Rainier and, and his wife's car still locked up. You haven't seen, now that went off the road. Uh, everyone there is a killer. This is killer company, and it's killer country. So will Mondale help us? No, but will he be better when it comes down? In fact, on the way home, I'm going to go to uh, Moss Landing. There's a button shop, and I collect buttons. I want one made ABR, anybody but Reagan. Because you don't have time. In fact, I'll advertise on the air and sell them at cost. You don't have time now to decide. These Democrats shouldn't fight each other because one justice of the Supreme Court was in the hospital last week. Just wait till Reagan gets all of them. 
They've already charted their ages. And with George Bush as vice president, you know, they can have their heart attacks. They're old. Their blood diseases, they're not going to last. We're going to have a court, like a, a Roman court, going to last forever. It won't matter who's present. The court will hear nothing. It will appeal nothing. It will, you know, death penalties. Women's week, it will give you no right to an abortion, even if you're raped. I don't care who of the Democrats is elected. I won't even discuss that on my program. Not at all. Because that court is going to be so horrendous. Now, he wanted a, a provision in the CIA that anybody who wrote a book about the government had to have it screened through them. And if you wrote a novel, it had to be screened. He put that off, he said, till after the election. Many of you, I, how many of you were in California when Reagan had his second term? Holy mackerel, Ed Meese, you know, and the shooting of the students in the Isle of Vista, I often refer to that. In fact, a few weeks, I'm going to redo again, maybe every week, the segments from the book, California, the first parafascist state. As California goes, the world will go. And the guy who wrote that died a month after Reagan was elected. He never lived to see the inauguration. Well, my, he lives up, lived up north. Uh, famous writers die the week their books come out. But the, it is an issue. You asked about Mondale, and, and uh, it isn't an issue of those people. If you want to write to your body, there isn't a Democratic candidate that would force you not to have, not have that baby. And there isn't a Democratic candidate of those front runners, except Glenn, who's out now, uh, there isn't one of them that would, could have, think of a court appointment or an attorney general like he has. That man, there isn't anyone in Germany that could equal Hitler. This man is a genius. He is evil. And if you think that your choice of candidates that you have a choice, you only have one choice, and that's one thing everyone can do here, is register people to vote. Just get everyone, if everyone gets 20 new people to vote, I'm gonna go to her door, probably out in the Sleaze area, Carmel, most of the people registered, I'm gonna go to her door. It's the most important thing you can do. Because now your life is really on the line. He's deploying the missiles, he's ready for the war, John Lehman is ready for the war. You, you know what he's going to do now. It's when The next term, he's going to make John Tower Secretary of Defense. Yeah. He's announced that. It's going to be a night. It's like Goering, Goebbels, and Himmler. You have no idea what this man's capable of if you don't read your history. Yeah, your question? Uh, yes, I wanted to tell you that I was in New York when Rockefeller died, and uh, we announced it in the club I was working at, and everybody cheered and jumped up and down because he was controlling all the... Uh, Drugs and all in the mafia and the, the, on, yeah. and the whole everything that was coming in New York and he's going oh great you know you know he was controlling everything and he died but anyway I, I wanted to yeah but what's the drug increase he died and so his turf of drug has gone up two hundred percent yeah there's the year he died there's two hundred percent more narcotics in New York City now than when he died yeah. so okay come on and I also saw Flo Kennedy speak when I was there too but a friend of mine that was there, he had this theory that Ruby, Warren, and uh, Haldeman were, were, could have shot uh, JFK because, uh, because of the pictures and the angle of the bullet. Haldeman? Or the other guy that was there. So there was three of them. Well, there was a crossfire, but you mean, uh, you mean Frank Sturgis and E. Howard Hunt, that gang? Yeah, that's right. On the grassy Sturgis. knoll? Well, I think Sturgis could have been there. He's a, he's a schlepper and an important man, but I think he's more important than a lot of people know. Reading, rereading the Bay of Pigs stories and his role in Germany and with the top echelon, and he's a survivor. Uh, survivors don't have to be on a street corner. If you go to Texas, it's no bigger than this room, actually, the little grassy knoll. You think it's a whole panorama or coliseum. It's just a little place with a building and a fence and an overpass. Uh, people like E. Howard Hunt, who's a CIA director for so many years, who's the station chief in Paraguay, who graduates from Yale, why the hell would he be seen that day with all the cameras when a president's killed? It, he says he was in Washington, and I, a lot of the researchers flaked off from me, uh, A.J. Weberman, and people got mad at me because I wouldn't accept the tramp theory. I don't accept anything that isn't logical and can't be proved. Well, my theory is that tramps were arrested in the boxcars and stra tramps were not kept on the police ledger and that the assassins were flown out of town and that there was a crossfire. But I don't think that you use that motley, that crowd who were so high up. When you have a gunman, you don't use 
uh, somebody who's prominent in the intelligence community. How obvious would that be? Alan Dulles was removed from the Bay of Pigs by John Kennedy, and E. Howard Hunt was in charge of the operation. You wouldn't have him standing there shooting him and Dulles on the Warren Commission. That isn't the way the system works. Yeah. They get some well-trained guys who, I, the information I got from Oaxaca, Mexico, that group down there, they train them, and from North Carolina, from Fort Bragg, who practice this over and over, whose names you'll never know and you'll never see them again. You don't use people, station chiefs, walking down the grass. Doesn't make sense. Let me take you a minute. Yeah. I'd just like to know a little more about 